How about witches, warlocks, evil spirits? <laughs>
trying to call her back, come out of that world, be that golden lampstand in this dark world. Don't go here. Come back to your first love. Can you understand how he can see this as spiritual fornication and spiritual adultery? He's telling the church, don't go this way. Come back to me. You see, right here is what we should be eating. This and this alone. This is our history. This is our present. And this is our future. If you say, I don't know where I'm going, I got a book for you. It will be the roadmap to all roadmaps. Many teachings in today's churches have now caused people confusion. Because in one place, they're, they're in, in, in the sanctuary, we say, okay, we're celebrating this, and this is wonderful, and this is what we're celebrating, and God is good. But as soon as we leave out those doors, we change hats. And now we're celebrating something completely different. And what this has caused is double-mindedness. You see, in James 1 and 8, it says, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. What this means is we're in bed with both good and evil. And do you see what that's going to cause? Total chaos. And yet we don't understand why our minds aren't clear. It's because we're trying to serve two masters, and that doesn't work. Let's read um, what the Lord said to the next church in Thyatira, and it's found in Revelation 2 and 20. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. Okay, using the name Jezebel, what the Lord here is trying to remind us is who she was. What did she do? Well, Jezebel was a heathen that would bring idol worship and fornication into the worship of God. You see, that was the most critical point of the letter to Thyatira, how people had conditioned themselves to think that it was okay, that this, this worship, this pagan worship was okay. And if you, if you compromise on this little bit, then they're going to get you to compromise on a little more and a little more. You see, right now, we can't see, honestly, if, if, a, if a, somebody that has never heard of Christ look at the church, most churches, you couldn't tell the difference between the church and the world. If you get nothing else today, hear me on that. Every little compromise, everything you do, it will dull you to the point where you don't want to hear what God is trying to tell you. It will dull your senses. So, let me ask you now, what does all of this have to do with Halloween? Well, I'm glad you asked. Have you ever heard of the god, pagan god, Sam Hain? Sometimes it's called So Win or So Ween. He was a pagan god of the dead. See, holiday is the new year. For the occult. Halloween is the granddaddy of all holidays when it comes to the occult and it is dedicated strictly for their favorite god Lucifer. You see I don't care what name they gave the gods. I don't care. I mean you've got Moloch, you've got Baal, you've got all kinds of gods. However when you narrow it down to who it really is, it's Lucifer. He desires our worship. He desires all worship. Well, there's a special ritual. And I'm going to go over a few of these things. According to the Old Text and Manuscripts, this ritual was to honor the God of the dead, consisting of lighting candles, making a feast, and leaving it out on your doorstep all night long. Now, the lights and the candles were to light the way for your dead friends and family to come and visit. Yes, I'm being serious. They believed that on that night, the physical realm, which is here in the spiritual realm, there is a, there is a, a barrier. 
And that barrier goes real thin between the two realms. And they believe that their dead friends and family and enemies and pets, they can all come back and visit them. So after they prepare their feast and they put all their candles and everything out on the porch, then they start praying to their god their dark mother and their dark father, I believe, for protection and guidance and blessing them on their journey. Now, if their, f their friends and their dead relatives and all these people say, okay, we'll accept your feast, your offering, then they believe that they're going to have a really good year. They believe, and, and I'm not talking just monetary, that they believe the spirits, their dead family and friends, would come and they would tell them secrets to get them through to the next year, maybe on their enemies or how they can do their job better or whatever it might be. They believe that's what their dead friends and family will come and do if they accept your offering. And again, they're not talking to their dead family members, okay? These are spirits. Now, if the, if the dead family members and friends don't accept their offering, then they believe bad things, very bad things, are going to happen for their next year. In fact, the people that actually practice this ritual would notice that a lot of homes did not have the candles and the things out on the porch. So what they would do is they would go up to the porch and they would knock on the porch and when, they, when the person, the homeowner, answered, they would say three words. Can you guess what those words are? It was to cast a spell. Do it, or bad things are coming to you. Do you remember me talking about your, the dead enemies that can come back to? OK, well, with the dead enemies, what they would do is they didn't want to get recognized. So they dressed up in costumes. The scarier, the better. Hoping that they can trick the enemy that's coming at them, that they wouldn't notice them. Does any of this sound familiar? Just, just asking. The ritual also includes dancing, feasting, taking nature walks, and building on altars to honor our ancestors. To symbolize the end of harvest, they include apples, pumpkins, fall crops, and if you practice the dark side of it, which not everyone did, but it also required sacrifice. Now, a few of the rituals that I have listed on here is some of the things that they would put out, such as skulls and candles and straw men and wearing costumes and corn, dark loaves of bread, apples, leaves, nuts, acorns, mulled wine, cider, and pumpkins. When you participate in this ritual, what you're doing is you're invoking or inviting spirits, whether to come into your home or to you. That's what you're doing. And I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit here. I'm talking about demons that you don't want to mess with because they will follow you home and it is difficult to get rid of. You know that thing where you, um, you know, it's a glass breaker um, it's, a, it's a nail pounder. It's, huh? Hammer. You see, no matter what I called it, you eventually figured out what I'm talking about. So doesn't the world. No matter what you call it, if it's the same symbols, if it's the same night, it's still pagan. They know what you're talking about. The devil knows what you're talking about. Why does the world want what you've got? You've got what the world has. I'm just saying. You might be sitting there thinking, I've got a pumpkin on my sidewalk or on my porch. Am I invoking spirits here? Question is, probably not. No. There is a difference between having a nice home with some natural things that God has given us. God gave us pumpkins. God gave us beautiful flowers and acorns. And However, we get into the wrong area 
when we start putting faces on it and dead skeletons and skulls and lights and then we start perverting God's natural order. And you see, it started with a pumpkin, then I had to add a scarecrow, and then, and, and do you see that the more items, I'm getting deeper and deeper into this ritual. Does your home say, it's fall time, or does it say happy Halloween? Because you are sending a message. What we do as Christians, people are always watching us. You are sending a message, whether we're decorating our home, what we say out of our mouth, they're always watching. And when they see something that's no different from them, then they don't want what you have. Understand that. How do we rank as a church? How do we rank as individuals? I will tell you today that God is going to hold us accountable. He says so. I've only touched on one holiday. And there's many more. But let's just see what God has to say in his word. And let's weigh this against the word of Christ. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or anyone practicing homosexuality. No thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. You see, the number one commandment, if you look at Exodus 20 and 2, it says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, you shall have no other gods before me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of help you with the meaning on that because for me, when I, when I was just starting out and learning, I thought, well, you know, have other gods before him. That does not mean that I can worship something else and then worship God. It means if I worship God, I'm okay because I can go out and then I can do these other rituals. No, what this means is when I worship or when I do the rituals or when I'm out here, I'm becoming an unclean vessel. And I cannot approach a holy God. I can't come before him unclean. That is, have no other gods before me. You see, when I'm worshiping, I can go into a whole just different realm with God in my worship. And when I leave, people will look at me and go, wow, you look so different. You look almost like you're glowing. Why? Because people can see the spirit on me. God can see the spirits on us. Have no other God before me. Don't bring it before me. You see, God does not want us lukewarm. He doesn't want one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. He wants us all or nothing. That's who he wants in his kingdom. And if you are one foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom, you're gone. He says, I will spit you out of my mouth. Understand this is serious. And I know that I'm taking a little more time, and if you just bear with me, I, I want to finish this because it's so serious that we get this today. You see, don't think for a moment that Satan's going to come looking nasty and ugly and broken down and boring and boring and boring. No. He deals with our fleshly senses. Shiny, pretty, new, fun, happy, fun. Can I say fun? Because normally that is the reason that we have an issue when it comes to looking back, pulling back and saying, should I celebrate this? I'm missing out on all the fun. However, that's exactly what he wants you to think. So that you will be blinded to the fact of what is really going on. The only ones that were rewarded in Revelation was the overcomers. 
And I truly believe that everyone here wants to be an overcomer. I think we all want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Nobody is here to try to judge you or to condemn you. If I see you out there in a trick-or-treat costume outfit, I'm not saying nothing because it's not for me to judge you. This is between you and God. You see, Dave and I, we had to make a decision for our home, for us. However, I believe that just as Jesus came as a lamb, a sacrifice, the first time, he is coming back as a lion and the judge. And if we keep doing what the world is doing, we are going to get the reward that the world is going to get. I don't want that. I don't think any of us wants that. Right now, we have a spiritual battle going on. And as this battle goes on, as fathers, mothers, grandparents, you are the example. Your children are watching you, just like you watched your mother and your grandmother and grandmother before that. They're watching your example. Ask yourself, have I been part of this? Am I okay with this? If you are, that's fine. But there may be some here today that says, wow, I didn't know all of this. I wasn't aware. Today is the day, today, is a day to say, Lord, I give it to you. I don't want to be part of this pagan worship. I don't want any more of this idol gods between you and me. I don't want to be an unclean vessel where I can't approach you. But what I really want is clean hands, clean heart. Can you bow your heads? I had to come and repent before him after hearing and seeing and researching this. Lord, I was wrong and I'm sorry. Forgive me because I don't want anything between you and me. If you need to talk to God, you can do it right there from the seat or you can come up to the altar. And I don't ever want to forget. Let's say you're here and you don't know God as your personal Savior. Then I invite you all the more to come. The days are getting shorter. Time is getting shorter. And I don't want any one of you to be able to walk up to me and say, you didn't tell me. decision is yours and God is calling you 